ओके world history that are just more important than other topics. Today's yeah. topic, the Columbian Exchange, is one of those topics. So let's review the Columbian Exchange. Your teacher uh, definitely covered this topic. It's way too big to skip over. We're gonna focus in on one aspect of the Columbian Exchange that people like you tend to get tripped up on. This is not the Columbian Exchange. Don't feel bad. People mix it up all the time. It's easy to just act like the Columbian Exchange refers to the trade routes that developed because of the growth of the maritime empires. Eh, wrong, wrong. We call this trade system the Atlantic system. It used to be called the Triangular Trade, which is objectively a better name. So then what the hell is the Columbian Exchange? First off, it's a historically new term. It didn't come around until the 1970s. In 1972, historian professor Alfred Crosby wrote a book called The Columbian Exchange, Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492. And there's a couple things to take away from this book. One, it was written in 1972 and no one cared at the time. In fact, later editions at the front, it will say, no one cared about this book when it came out and now anyone talks about the importance of maritime empires or global trade in this period. All they talk about is the Columbian Exchange. So two, check that title again. Biological and cultural consequences. Keyword, consequences. Think of the Columbian Exchange as the Columbian consequences, the aftermath. Back in 72, Crosby was focused in on plants and crops and seeds and the consequences of those transfers. Later historians added things like diseases and animals and the impact of humans going back and forth. But focus on the word consequence. The Columbian Exchange is all about the after effects of what's happening as a result of all of these interconnections in Unit 4 and how that affects the course of history. So the Columbian Exchange has come to take on a lot of different definitions over the years. Some even include the impact of different cultures had on each other. But one thing the Columbian Exchange is not is a trade route. It's a concept. Okay, we rock two a days for the land base empire, so let's do the same thing. What the hell is the Columbian Exchange? First off, it's a historically new term. It didn't come around until the 1970s. In 1972, historian professor Alfred Crosby wrote a book called The Columbian Exchange, Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492. And there's a couple things to take away from this book. One, it was written in 1972 and no one cared at the time. Biological and cultural consequences. Keyword, consequences. Think of the Columbian Exchange as the Columbian consequences, the aftermath. Back in 72, Crosby was focused in on plants and crops. We call this trade system the Atlantic system. System. It used to be called the triangular trade, which is objectively a better. Hi, my name is Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures and campus events more accessible and inclusive. Europeans are using the new maritime tech to expand their empires exponentially. The College Board gives you five, but we're going to cover four. Why? Because France is meh. Today, we start with the first two chronologically the Portuguese and the Spanish. Portugal. The Portuguese Maritime Empire actually starts in the last period before 1450. Sorry, College Board, sometimes even your periodization is incorrect. Don't believe me? Remember that Trans-Saharan trade map? Who's that little boat on the west coast over there? Surprise! It's Portugal. Heads up, this is the only time Portugal shows up in the entire course. So if you see anything on the AP exam even loosely connected to Portugal, it's probably boat related. Portugal is first, chronologically. Their empire is the 11th biggest all time. And let's be honest, that's like 90% Brazil. So when you're thinking back to Portugal, think about these four things. One, Prince Henry. Remember that little boat on the map, the little guy going around the west coast of Africa over there? That was Prince Henry. He sponsored the first voyages to attempt to circumnavigate the Islamic control of the trade routes. He actually thought he was on another crusade, but this time the goal was to get around Dar al-Islam. And he succeeded, and then he died. But his efforts to circumnavigate 
navigate the Islamic world are the baby steps that start this whole process going. Two, location, location, location. Look at Portugal. It's the furthest west you can go in Europe. Shut up, Iceland. No one cares. Geographically, think of Portugal as the far. No one cares. Look at Portugal. It's the furthest west you can go in Europe. Shut up, Iceland. No one cares. Geographically, think of Portugal as the far end of Unit 2, the far end of the networks of exchange. Anything the Portuguese are getting has changed hands a million times, and that price just goes up. So logically, it makes sense that they're the ones who were the first to endeavor out into the ocean. They need the direct access to Asia more than anyone else. You think Italy's going to go out exploring? They have a direct connection to the Ottomans. They're not going anywhere. No, all of these maritime empires will be built by those at the far ends of the network of exchange. First port. Portugal, then Spain, Britain, the Dutch, France. Three, it's a trading post empire. They're the first Europeans to enter the Indian Ocean trade by rounding up the coast of Africa, and they take advantage by setting up trading posts like the one seen on this map. For the same reason you aren't on a WorldCom phone using AOL to get to your Friendster account, Portugal is not going to dominate forever. Ask your parents what that last sentence means if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Just because you're not going to dominate forever using AOL to get to your Friendster account, Portugal is not going going to dominate forever. Ask your parents what that last sentence means if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Just because you're an early adopter of something doesn't mean that's going to last forever. Yes, they will hold on to some territories. Brazil, Angola, Mozambique. But when you think of Portugal and the maritime empires, think of them as the first to the plate. The fourth thing to know about the Portuguese empire, the slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade is arguably the worst thing to ever happen in the history of the planet. We don't have time to do this justice here, so I'm going to link some videos down below where you can actually get a good deep dive into the impact of the transatlantic slave trade. But I bring it up talking about just because you're an early, but this time the goal was access to Asia more than empires. Think of them as the first here because the Portuguese are the first to start taking slaves back to Europe and then eventually across the ocean, across the Middle Passage. And statistically, the Portuguese are the number one shipper of slaves during this entire period. Finally, today, Spain. Now the Spanish empire, that was an empire. Fifth all time. Your teacher was probably obsessed with the Spanish Empire. They're kind of a big deal in this period. So I'm just going to touch on a few topics. One, coerced labor. Spain has a huge chunk of the Americas. And they put the natives, who hadn't died of smallpox, to work for them in their encomienda system. Think of the Native Americans as becoming like serfs to the Spanish. The encomienda system itself took the idea of people owing labor to the state that people like the Inca had done in the Mita system and applied it directly to the newcomers, the Spanish, in the New World. And so the Spanish co-opted this idea of labor for the state and used it for things like mining or cash crop farming. So encomienda is the guaranteed grant of labor that the Spanish were given by the crown once they arrived in the New World. Don't confuse this with the hacienda system. The encomienda is the actual grant of labor given to a landowner. The hacienda system were private plantations where cash crops were grown for international markets. Due to disease and works of people like Bartolome de las Casas, the Spanish will eventually move away from the encomienda system. But the hacienda system will continue to grow using more and more slave labor. Second for the Spanish is silver. Spain loved silver so much they named one of their vice royalties the River of Silver. But careful what you wish for, they find so much that it causes massive inflation known historically as the Price Revolution. Also, stop thinking of Earth as a map. We're an oblate spheroid. Spain took silver from mines in places like Potosi and shipped it directly to their other colony, the Philippines. From there, they could buy and sell and trade in those East Asian markets, most notably in China. Third for Spain, Catholicism. Empire building wasn't just about silver and power. It was also about souls. You can view the spread of Spanish Catholicism as an extension of the Crusades competing directly with Islam. Or you can view it as a direct extension of Catholicism's fight with Protestantism and their competition with places like Germany, Britain, or the Netherlands. Either way, it worked. Latin America and the Philippines are both incredibly Catholic even today. All right. Ugh. Those are the first two maritime empires. Next up, the British and the Dutch. Some trading companies. I'll see you tomorrow.
Hi, my name is Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures and campus events more exciting. All right, enough about the first wave. Spain and Portugal may be first, but what about the new kids on the block? Today, let's talk about the British and Dutch empires. Let's begin with the most important of the two, the Dutch. That's right, Britain. You think I forgot about 1776 and 1812? <laughs> I hold grudges. Also, if you're thinking the British Empire, oh, the largest empire of all time, that's in the next period. That's not this British Empire. This British Empire is another trading post empire. Wait until they start to industrialize, then they're gonna be a problem for everyone else. So, the Dutch. When you think of the Dutch in AP World History, you should think about this. That's right, the old Veringity Oostendisch Compagni. That's right, the VOC, the Dutch East India Trading Company. This is the most successful company of all time, bigger than Apple, bigger than Amazon, bigger than GameStop, bigger than Freemanpedia itself. It serves as the blueprint for how a joint stock company should be run. Back in 1602, the VOC was incorporated and given a royal monopoly on all trade in Asia. Most of these compagnies were chartered for one trip to one place one time. The VOC, it was chartered for 21 years for all trade in the Indian Ocean, and it lasted nearly two centuries. Their domination of Indonesia and their access to the Spice Islands there will make them filthy rich. The VOC itself was actually more like an overseas branch of the Dutch government. They had their own armies, printed their own money, fought in their own wars, and their flouts were doing all the heavy lifting in the Indian Ocean trade during this period as well. Think of Dutch flouts in the Indian Ocean like Amazon or UPS trucks trading spices and everything else around the Indian Ocean and East Asian trade. Remember how Japan went full Sokoko? Everyone out! And wasn't letting anyone in Britain. Bro, I was not paying attention. Let's begin with the most important of the two, the Dutch. That's right, Britain. You think I forgot about 1776 and 1812? <laughs> I hold grudges. Also, if you're thinking the British Empire, oh, the largest empire of all time, that that's in the next period. That's not this British Empire. This British Empire is another trading post empire. Wait until they start to industrialize, then they're gonna be a problem for everyone else. So, the Dutch. When you think of the Dutch in AP World History, you should think about this. That's right, the old Veringity Oostendisch Compagni. That's right, the VOC, the Dutch East India Trading Company. This is the most successful company of all time. Bigger than Apple, bigger than Amazon, bigger than GameStop bigger than Freemanpedia itself. It serves as the blueprint for how a joint stock company should be run. Back in 1602, the VOC was incorporated and given a royal monopoly on all trade in Asia. Most of these compagnies were chartered for one trip to one place one time. The VOC, it was chartered for 21 years for all trade in the Indian Ocean and it lasted nearly two centuries. Their domination of Indonesia and their access to the Spice Islands there will make them filthy rich. The VOC itself was actually more like an overseas branch of the Dutch government. They had their own armies, printed their own money, fought in their own wars, and their flouts were doing all the heavy lifting in the Indian Ocean trade during this period as well. Think of Dutch flouts in the Indian Ocean like Amazon or UPS trucks, trading spices and everything else around the Indian Ocean and East Asian trade. Remember how Japan went full Sokoko? Everyone out! And wasn't letting anyone in or out and only traded in a few spots with just China and Korea? Nah, they loved the Dutch so much they built a special little island off the coast of Nagasaki called Dishima, where at certain times of the year, even the Dutch could trade in Japan. So if the Dutch are on the AP World Modern exam in May, it's gonna have something to do with the Dutch East India Trading Company. Okay, last empire today, the British Empire. So the Dutch had the VOC, but the British also had a pretty powerful trading company, the British East India Trading Company and the British West India Trading Company. The British in this period are just another trading post empire, but notice where they put down roots. In the next period, India will become the jewel in their crown, along with a huge chunk of Africa. Even though it's not massive yet, the empire has everything. The Caribbean islands, Central American colonies, 
East Coast American colonies, Indian colonies, African trading posts, Atlantic islands. You know when you're playing Monopoly and people are just buying whatever properties they land on, but there's that one person who always ends up winning because they're strategically choosing their places for the long run? Well, that's Britain. They're playing the long game. So any trade route like the Indian Ocean trade or the transatlantic trade will have the British involved in some way, shape, or form. They're even using every form of coerced labor. They're using every style of ruling from direct rule to company rule. Whatever you're talking about in this period, the British has you covered. But when the College Board asks you about the British Empire on the AP World History Modern exam, it's probably not this one. It's the one from Unit 6, the largest empire of all time. But don't think all these people are cool with the Europeans showing up and getting all in their business. Next up, we meet the challengers to state power from Unit 4. I'll see you tomorrow. Hi, my name's Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures and campus events. Imagine you're just sitting in your own home, making your own fun, and some Dutch guy kicks in your door demanding spices, or some British guy demanding tea, or some Spanish guy demanding silver. Are you just gonna sit there and take this abuse from these people? Nah, we've been at this for a couple weeks, I think I know you guys pretty well. You're the kind of person who strikes back. And not like The Empire Strikes Back, which is easily the most overrated of the Star Wars films. Yeah, I said it, overrated. I'm talking about the kind of person who strikes back and or challenges state power. Today, let's break down the challengers to state power. Fifty-six days left and we finally meet the resistance. That's right, the challengers to state power. The College Board is kind enough to give you Eight illustrative examples here. Eight. Let's go to the map. See, that's a lot. I even added Tokugawa here since they definitely challenge these new maritime empires by kicking them out. Just assume that wherever an empire is expanding, there will be people there to challenge that expansion. Let's review through four of them today so you can get a good idea of what challenger to state power is all about. Let's go west to east. First, Queen Nanny in Jamaica. This is a great example because it both builds on your background knowledge about the transatlantic slave trade and gives you some historical info that will be helpful for you in the next unit. Who is expanding into Jamaica? The British. Who is challenging this expansion? The Maroons. Maroons are former slaves who escaped and are now living off the land. Their leader was Nanny of the Maroons, or Queen Nanny as she's known today. She was a Shanti from modern day Ghana whose village lost a war and she became a POW. From there, she was sold into slavery and sent to Jamaica to farm sugar. She escaped in Jamaica and took to the countryside. Once in the hinterlands, she led the Maroons in raids against the British and even fought to free over a thousand slaves. They were so formidable that the British actually had to sign a treaty with Queen Nanny and her Maroon army. So that's how she challenged both slavery and the expansion of the British Empire. Second, Anna Nzinga in Angola. Who's expanding into Angola? The Portuguese. Who is challenging that expansion? Queen Nzinga of Northern Angola. Queen Nzinga fought to stop the Portuguese from enslaving her people and sending them to sugar plantations in the New World. Nzinga stood up to the Portuguese and African slavers and their superior weaponry. She was formidable enough that she was able to save the majority of the people of Ndongo from slavery, and even forcing the King of Portugal to renounce his claims to Ndongo in 1657. That's how she challenged the Portuguese Empire and the transatlantic slave trade at the same time. Third. Pugachev's Rebellion. Yeah, I know this is technically in the next period, so shut up about it. But let's try something a little different here. How about a challenge from within an existing empire? An internal challenger. Who is being challenged in Russia? The Romanov Tsars. Who is challenging the Romanov Tsars? The Cossacks. That's right, the Freemen of Russia. And in this case, one specific Cossack, Pugachev. So this specific Cossack rebellion is in the next period, but it's the largest rebellion in Russian history to this point, so I figured we'd bring it up now. And the College Board calls out the Cossack rebellions as a specific example, so let's just do this. Think of the Cossacks as Russian serfs or peasantry who got fed up with the serf life and decided, you know what, I want to go live out on the steppe and live as the Mongols once did, on horseback, living by your wits. Ever heard of Cossackstan? Yeah, that's where. So the Cossacks were led by Pugachev and thought that the current Empress of Russia, Catherine the Great, was a usurper. And to be fair, she was a German lady who married the Tsar, moved to Russia, had him killed, and then ruled Russia. Think about that. You move into Russia, kill our Tsar, and walk around the palace like you own the place? Are you out of your mind? I'm not saying Pugachev should have led a rebellion to try to take down the Russian Empire, but I understand. 
Oh, and Pugachev claimed to be the reincarnation of the dead Tsar, so that's something I skipped over. Anyways, the rebellion is eventually squashed when the Russian army returns from fighting the Ottomans and focused their attention directly on Pugachev and the Cossacks, and that was kind of it. But that's how the Cossacks challenged the Russian Empire from within for the Maratha conflict with the Mughals. Your teacher was all about the Mughal Empire. Can you think you can wear headphones? Last period with their palaces and their wealth and their tajas and their akbars. Can I can I take a second here to stand up for the Hindus? Where where are my Hindus at? Google a Moogle map. Yeah, I know it rhymes, but do it. Google it. These things don't write themselves. Just do it. See how it never fully takes up the subcontinent? Stand up. A badass. But we will see some challengers to imperial expansion later on when this whole process starts again in Unit 6. But how did all of this affect the social hierarchies? I'll see you tomorrow. Hi, my name's Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures and campus events. All right, one more section from Unit 4, and then we're done with Unit 4. So how does all this massive imperial expansion from Units 3 and Units 4 affect social stratification? Today, we look at the changing social hierarchies of the early modern period. <laughs> look at that. We are 55 days away and we are nearly clear of the first four units. So let's finish this unit by talking about the social hierarchy. Maybe now is a good time to tell you it's okay to ask what you might feel is a stupid question. If you see words like hierarchy and you're like, I don't know what hierarchy is, and at this point, I'm afraid to ask, don't be. We are history teachers. We use these words all the time. So sometimes we'll just use a word and assume you know what it means. Never be afraid to be like, explain it to me like I'm five. Hierarchy just means the way people rank themselves, whether it's religiously or for status or for authority. And don't feel bad. I made it like 20 years not knowing what the word bureaucracy meant. And what does bureaucracy mean? It's just the different branches or departments within the government that do the work of making the government function. Like the State Department, the Department of Energy, the DMV. That's the bureaucracy. But today it's all about social hierarchy or rankings. And honestly, your teacher probably covered this stuff with the empires themselves, but let's go over them one by one just so you get a good idea of the social hierarchies of the early modern period. First, the way the empire treated minorities. These are things like millets in the Ottoman Empire, where each religious minority within the Ottoman Empire had its own government structure underneath the rule of the Ottomans. That's right, there was a Catholic bureaucracy, an Armenian bureaucracy, a Jewish bureaucracy, an Orthodox bureaucracy. In fact, one of the illustrative examples that they give you here is how the Ottomans opened the door for all those Jews and Muslims who were expelled during the Reconquista in Spain in 1492. The Ottoman Sultan basically sent a private jet to Spain to pick them up and bring them back to the Ottoman Empire. No, seriously, check out the boat. Classy. Second, new empires means new rulers, which means new elites. Elites are the top of the top of the hierarchy, the top of the pyramid. There are a ton of examples here, but here's a quick few. Russia had the boyars. Think nobility that just live in Russia. The Manchus, who took over China and became the Qing dynasty, set up a system like the millets in the Ottoman Empire known as the banners. The Mongols had a banner. The Han Chinese had a banner, the Manchu had a banner, and probably the most famous of all of these, and the one you definitely went over in class, is the classification in the new world of people based on skin color known as the Costas. It's good to be king. No matter how many new elites there are, new groupings that are in charge, they all have the same problem in this era. The top of both the hierarchy and the bureaucracy is the monarch. Call it whatever you want. A king, a czar, an emperor, a sultan, whatever, it doesn't matter. The top leaders of the hierarchy and the bureaucracy in this period got stronger and gained more power and influence. Think about it. Louis XIV in France, Suleiman the Lawgiver in the Ottoman Empire, Kong Ji in China, Peter the Great in Russia, Akbar the Great in the Mughal Empire. These are some of the most powerful monarchs of all time. So you can be a boyar or a creole or whatever, but you ain't king. So we have new systems of hierarchy, new elites, all having to deal with a much more powerful monarch. Boom. Unit 4, Dunzo. But all this king talk makes me think we need to crown an MVP for Unit 4. See you tomorrow. Hi, my name's Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures and campus events. Our MVP list so far is elite. Ibn Battuta, Mata Musa, 
Akbar the Great. And there's so many to choose from in Unit 4, but I'm gonna go a different direction this time. I need someone who exemplifies all parts of Unit 4. Someone who's part of a maritime empire, actually lived overseas, directly tied to multiple coerced labor systems, directly tied to the spread of a major religion, and affected change in the empire they lived in. The MVP of Unit 4 is Bartolome de las Casas. I will tell you this up front. De Las Casas is not mentioned in the CED, but every part of his life is mentioned by the College Board. Plus, my man was a prolific writer. So you're more likely to hear from Bartolome de Las Casas than you are from Peter the Great or Suleiman the Magnificent. Pretty sure your teacher talked about this guy, but if not, don't worry, I got you. First, check out that haircut. He clearly respects the Manchu overlords like I do by voluntarily adopting this hairstyle. Second, he was born in Spain and immigrated to Cuba in 1502. He ran a hacienda with slave labor. Then he became the first priest to be ordained in the New World. He went on campaigns and saw the Spanish cruelty to the Native Americans firsthand. After a few years, he gives up his encomienda, frees his Native American slaves, and began a campaign to end the encomienda system itself. He returns to Spain, becomes the defense attorney for the Native Americans in the Great Valladolid Debate of 1550. He He had crazy ideas like Native Americans are humans and should be treated like humans. Through his work, the Spanish Empire passed the new laws to defend Native Americans. The encomienda concept went away in most of the Spanish Empire due to the work of Bartolome de las Casas. The practice did persist in some parts of New Spain and Peru, but it was finally abolished in the 1700s. So that's my MVP, a Spanish Catholic encomendero who saw the coerced labor system firsthand and gave it all up and went back to Spain and argued directly to the king in favor of equal treatment for Native Americans. All right, enough of the early modern period, 1450 to 1750. Let's get to the modern period, 1750 to 1900. I'll see you tomorrow. Hi, my name's Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures and campus events. Let's take a minute to acknowledge that we are chronologically halfway through the course. Yeah! That's right, we've covered the first two periods. Unit one, the Global Tapestry, and Unit two, Networks of Exchange, were both in that post-classical period, which ran from 1200 to 1450. Units three and four, the land-based and maritime-based empires, were in the early modern period, 1450 to 1750. Well, the next two units are in the modern period, which runs 1750 to 1900. Now, if you go to frameopedia.com, click up top there, and you can see the site is divided by different periods. Click the modern period and this whole page is devoted to the modern period. But towards the top of the page, you can click either unit and go to a page just about that unit. And within that unit, a page about each section of the unit. The modern period breaks into three major topics. First, the political revolutions, the American, the Haitian, the Latin American revolutions. Second, the industrial revolution. And third, new imperialism. So let's start at the beginning of unit five with 5.1 the Enlightenment. I'm not going to spend too much time on the Enlightenment here today. I mean, it's a pretty basic idea. Remember the scientific revolution? All those science nerds were like, everything must be scientifically proven to me. Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Harvey. All those guys that use reason and logic to prove things that were true or disprove things that were false. So you take that idea and you apply it to your rights as a human. That's the Enlightenment. Your teacher probably went through like a thousand different philosophs or French Enlightenment writers. Maybe an American, maybe a British guy. But this is review, so let's focus on one document that does all the work for us. The 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Every Enlightenment thing you need to know was compiled in this document. Think of it as the French Bill of Rights, because that's what it is. They even passed it the same year as our Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson even helped them finish writing it. So if you need a culmination of all the Enlightenment writers' thoughts and ideas and theories wrapped into one use the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Enough. It even starts with the inverse of genre. Declaration of... Uh, no. No. Declaration. No. Yeah, no. Yeah. 
Jacques Rousseau's famous line from The Social Contract. Rousseau famously said, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Think about all the chains we talked about in the first four units. And Rousseau's Social Contract book was a little too controversial at the time and got banned by Louis in 1762. But fast forward 27 years later and it's the opening line of the new Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. The inverse that opens the declaration reads, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. See what they did there? None of those absolute monarchs from the last couple units would have had anything to do with anything like this. But the modern period is a new period. And writers like Rousseau and Locke and Jefferson all push for human rights to be guaranteed in a social contract. And that's exactly what the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen was. A social contract. Guaranteed rights written into law. The Declaration goes on to guarantee other rights like speech, assembly, life, liberty, property, due process. People need to be careful throwing around all these revolutionary concepts. I mean, we spent the last few weeks building these massive empires ruled by these all-powerful monarchs. <laughs> be a shame if something happened to them. I'll see you tomorrow. Second. Scientific revolution replied to human rights. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. This is one of the largest sections in the entire course, 5.2 Revolutions. So let's go. Today, we review the modern revolutions. If your teacher was like me, they spent way too much time on these revolutions. But don't sleep on these revolutions. They are important. I know yesterday we started a new period, but this isn't just a chunk of time where history happened. This period, the modern period, 1750 to 1900, will see massive changes in every aspect of the human experience. And today we point our focus at the political world. Yeah, I made a map, so shut up about it. You can see the major revolutions labeled and the years of independence in the new world as well. I even added the illustrative examples of the nationalism movements that we'll talk about tomorrow. So the College Board breaks down this topic into three sections. One, the concept of revolution. Two, the revolutions themselves. And three, the revolutionary documents. This is a review and your teacher definitely went over these revolutions in class, so I'm gonna be brief. First, the concept of revolution. You probably get this concept, but the College Board breaks it down for you like this. The 18th century marked the beginning of an intense period of revolution and rebellion against existing governments, leading to the establishment of new nation states around the world. So people are going to overthrow their governments. Then they hit you again. Discontent with monarchist and imperial rule encouraged the development of systems of government in various ideologies, including democracy and 19th century liberalism. So people hate the kings and the empires, so they're going to overthrow them and replace them with democracies. There was a bonus vocab word there at the end. Did you see it? Liberalism. And don't pull a bureaucracy here and just move past this word and just skip it. You're better than that. Liberalism is not AOC and Bernie. We're talking classical liberalism. Remember remember everything we said yesterday about the Enlightenment? That's classical liberalism. Think liberal as in free, not liberal as in Rachel Maddow. Second, the revolutions themselves. If I reviewed these, we'd be here forever. So look back through your notes, your textbook, or Google it, or whatever. We just don't have time to do this. This is a review show. But do know that the College Board only mentions three of them. First, the American, obviously. Second, the Haitian Revolution. That's Toussaint and the slaves and Maroons going full Django on the slave owners on St. Domingue, which becomes Haiti in the early 1800s. And third, Latin America. That's code for Bolivar. Bolivar's the Tom Brady of this unit, just way less hateable. I know, I know. The College Board canceled the French Revolution like nobody would notice. So focus on these three, and these three are not illustrative examples. These are three listed specifically in the curriculum that you need to know. Third, the revolutionary documents. You know what revolutions are, you know the big three revolutions, but there are also documents that you need to know. The College Board is obsessed with documents. And these are also not illustrative examples that may be helpful to you one day. These are things specifically listed that you have to know, and you have to know all three. First, the Declaration of Independence. 
you get that one. The second one is the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen that I wouldn't shut up about yesterday. So let's focus on the third one, the last one the Jamaica letter. And this one is the most hardcore of them all. Listen to Jefferson. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary... Are you declaring independence or writing a poem, dude? Okay, listen to also Jefferson in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. The representatives of the French people have determined to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural unalienable... Blah, 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 blah. These fancy pants authors and their fancy pants declarations. Listen to Bolivar in the Jamaica letter. Success will crown our efforts because the destiny of America has been irrevocably decided. The tie that bound her to Spain has been severed. Ooh, that is some revolutionary talk. Okay, try this one. The hatred that the peninsula, meaning Spain, has inspired in us is greater than the ocean between us. It would be easier to have the two continents meet than to reconcile the spirits of the two countries. Or this one. We are threatened with the fear of death, dishonor, and every harm. There is nothing we have not suffered at the hands of that unnatural stepmother. Spain. Oh, man. <laughs> and he wrote it in a hostel in Jamaica, hence the name Jamaica Letter, after he'd been chased out of Venezuela. My man was at the end of his rope, writing a letter, the Jamaica Letter, to the British asking for help. And some, while in that hostel... Hmm? I said you had some uncles on studies. That's insane. You understand if you go outside, then the group is going to go though, right? Yeah. Wait, can I see? Can I see the bottom? Oh, it's because it's translucent rubber. You know what that means, right? It's better. You know what that means is the better and it interacts more and it's softer rubber and overall it's better, but you know what that means in general, right? Yeah. What? It's better. No, you're gonna, you're, it's gonna be gone in like the next, like, two months if you use it every day. No. You just, you just mean that the, the, we use the white, you just have to wipe it, that's it. Wait, can, I see? Can, you, can you take it off? I want to see the weight. Okay. Good. Now, you can tell those are heavy, though. No, you can tell those are heavy. John, I can tell those are heavy. Can you take them off? Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> Yes, I have, I really didn't shoot that before. When I was deciding to think about the pilot's house. Dude, all of my phones are worth $2,000. They're so bad, guys. I'm not going to do that anymore. Hey, hey, how are you? Dude, so bad. Dude, do you have to play way more? No, mine is the wrong. Five of them are wrong. Hey, why is it less than wrong? Where's the music card? Don't ask. Wait, don't, 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 so focus on those three documents. The Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, and the Jamaica Letter from Bolivar. Now, on top of all these revolutions and revolutionary documents, that's only half of 5.2. What about the nationalism of this unit? See you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a Yesterday, we focused in on the revolutions of 5.2, but that's only half the battle. The other half is nationalism. Today, we focus on the modern concept of nationalism. Let's start with what the college board means by nationalism. People around the world developed a new sense of commonality based on language, religion, social customs, and territory. This was sometimes harnessed by governments to foster a sense of unity. Keyword there? 
commonality. You probably associate with one nation or another, a group you share commonalities with. Now the College Board is going to use nationalism in two ways. First, from the last part of that quote, harnessed by governments to foster a sense of unity. This is referring to a few different nationalism movements that are mentioned in the curriculum. So let's focus in on two of them. The Germans under Otto von Bismarck and the Ottomans with Ottomanism, both of which used nationalism to foster a sense of unity. Bismarck used it to unify Germany in the 1870s. The Ottomans used it a little differently. The Ottomans used nationalism, or what they called Ottomanism, to get all of the different millets to think of themselves instead of being Armenian or Jewish or Orthodox or Sunni, instead to think of themselves as Ottoman. So their commonality was that they were Ottoman. And the second way they use nationalism is to challenge boundaries. Here's the College Board's take. Newly imagined national communities often linked this new national identity with borders of the state, and in some cases, nationalists challenged boundaries or sought unification of fragmented regions. Bismarck fits into this category too, using nationalism to unite all the German states into one nation, Germany. But but the challenge boundaries part is the one where four different illustrative examples reside. Here's my top two. First, the propaganda movement. The Filipinos towards the end of this period made a stand against the Spanish in a movement known as Don, the you, you... It was led by Dr. Jose but, Rizzo. But he was a Filipino please. ophthalmologist polymath who led the push for equality with the Spanish in the Philippines. And in the most Spanish empire move ever, they executed him for it by shooting him in the back. Now this guy's a national hero. I made an illustrative examples video about it. I highly recommend it. This guy stood up for the Filipinos and started the pro process, which will eventually lead to their independence in the 20th century. Second, the Maori in New Zealand. Don't even get me started on how amazing the Maori are. As the British are there, modernized and charging and trying to steal their land, you know, how the British do, they stood strong and threw a haka right in their stupid British faces. So that's nationalism. It's the commonality that people share and what they do with it. Either unifying the people or challenging national borders of an empire. Okay, so it took us a couple days, but we finally covered the first two sections of Unit 5. I hope the rest of this unit is some small topic that we can just kind of glance past, so uh, let me just look ahead here. Oh, right. <laughs> and the second way they use nationalism is to challenge one where four different illustrative examples reside. Here's my top two. First, the propaganda movement. The Filipinos towards the end of this period made a stand against the Spanish in a movement known as the propaganda movement. It was led by Dr. Jose Rizal. He was a Filipino ophthalmologist polymath who led the push for equality with the Spanish in the Philippines. And in the most Spanish empire move ever, they executed him for it by shooting him in the back. Now this guy's a national hero. I made an illustrative examples video about it. I highly recommend it. This guy stood up for the Filipinos and Hi, my name's Hannah, and I'm here to show you how students can use Otter to make lectures oh. and campus events. Can we get back to economics? So the last few days were all about big political changes, and it all stemmed from those Enlightenment writers from 5.1. The rest of this unit is all about the Industrial Revolution, so get comfortable. You've just entered Industrial Week here at Around the AP World in 80 Days Countdown. But you gotta start somewhere, so today we review the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> British people love this part. Don't let British people tell you that they're better than you. They're not. They're fancy accents and driving on the wrong side of the road. But this is an instance where they were better than you. They started the Industrial Revolution. It's like when you have to admit that Tom Brady is the goat because he is. 
but he's also just the worst? But don't worry, Unit 6 and Unit 8 are both a blueprint built to fuel your hatred and rage towards the British Empire. So we're gonna let Britain have this one. Let's go to the map. This is probably my favorite map I've made for this course. Okay, it's top five, but it does tell you everything you need to know for 5.3. It's a friggin' cartographical masterpiece. So let's go through the factors that led to the Industrial Revolution starting in Great Britain. And what I said earlier isn't true. The Brits aren't better than you. Their island is just better equipped to start the Industrial Revolution than your island. First, the waterways. Britain is crisscrossed by rivers, over a thousand navigable miles of river. Plus, in the late 1700s, they went ham on canals to connect what wasn't already connected. So Britain has a natural built-in highway system. Second, natural resources. They have all the ingredients for industrial practices to get underway. Tons of coal, tons of iron. Oh, not enough lumber? The US is basically one giant forest and we are shipping lumber to Britain on the regular. Third, property right. The guy who popularized the phrase life, liberty, and property was British. The guy who wrote the book on capitalism was British. So your property's protected. Fourth, empire. The British empire is massive in this period and especially in unit six where their empire will be the largest empire of all time. So if you need anything you don't have on this island, the British empire has you covered. Need to sell industrial produce products around the world? The British empire has you covered. Fifth, urbanization. Once factories get going, Britain's small towns will grow into large cities. They will have 12 cities over a population of 100,000 by the year 1850. They have the people, the labor, and the factories in these cities to produce, produce, produce. Six, the British Agricultural Revolution. The British Agricultural Revolution meant more food. More food means more people. More people means more labor. More labor means more production. More production means more capital. Speaking of capital, seventh, capital. The Brits have the money to invest. They have the first and largest stock market on the planet and an ever-growing massive empire, not to mention insurance on investments. So you won't go broke if you throw down some money to build a factory in Manchester. So there you have it. All in one map, 